Vincent, welcome back. It's great to be back. It's been, how long has it been since the last time? It's been a minute. It's been a minute. You know, there's some days where I think time flies and other days where I think time stands still, but that's what, that's the world we live in these days. I feel like I've blinked and two years just went by. <laughs> <laughs> so with that said, it's late 21 we're recording, but everyone's going to be listening to this in, in January 22. And look, I don't need to run through all of the terrible statistics around obesity and diabetes because our listeners have heard them over and over. So with that said, a lot of people are focused on weight management right now, including myself, had a little too much to eat over the holidays, want to shed a couple pounds, want to feel better. With all that said, what are we still getting wrong about weight management? Ooh, I think that is a, that's a really big question. And it ties back into the reasons that people gain weight in the first place. And I think people don't really understand this. And, you know, as a gut expert, uh, I love talking about the gut. And it happens to be really relevant as part of the underlying reason why people gain weight, why people also have difficulty losing weight. And there's a word I'm going to, I'm going to throw out there. It's a kind of a fancy word. It's called endotoxin. It's also known as LPS or lipopolysaccharide. It's part of the outer coating of gram negative bacteria. And as I'm sure everyone who follows mind, body, green, reads the blog, follows the podcast, you know, everybody knows about the gut microbiome by now and what a huge reservoir bacteria that is numbering up to a hundred trillion, anywhere between 500 and a thousand species. And a subset of those bacteria, these gram negative bacteria that have endotoxin. And we used to think that they only release endotoxin when they die, but they actually secrete endotoxin to the, into their environment inside the gut lumen. But that endotoxin can then get through the gut lumen and there's different ways that it gets through. If you tend to eat a lot of fatty meals, there's certain types of fats that are going to allow endotoxin to um, come into the body more e easily. If you just think about the name lipopolysaccharide, it's a part lipid molecule, so it's going to be fat soluble and that makes it easy for it to move through membranes. But then if you have leaky gut on top of it, then you're going to have more endotoxemia. So I just threw out another fancy word. And that, what that means is you've got a lot of endotoxin. The floodgates are open and you've got a lot of endotoxin coming into the body. And this is something that in, in studies, they can measure endotoxin levels. And the thing about endotoxin is to really understand the connection with obesity is that it binds to a certain type of receptor on cells. And these receptors are found on fat cells. They're found in the liver. They're found in the pancreas. They're found in muscle tissue. And they're also found in the brain. And this is called a toll-like receptor. So imagine every cell's got this toll. And in order to be able to pass through that toll, there's got to be, you've got to fit in like a lock and key. And lipopolysaccharide happens to fit in quite well to this toll-like receptor 4. And when it does, it comes into the cell and almost like one of those really cool domino displays where you just tip one domino and then it causes a cascade of events. When it gets into the cell, it activates NF-kappa B. And that's a gene expression that um, activates this factor called NF-kappa B which then turns on a whole subset of inflammatory genes. And what we have found is that there's a correlation between endotoxemia and weight gain, then eventually obesity, as well as metabolic syndrome, which is when blood sugars are rising, you're starting to become insulin resistant. So insulin, the hormone that controls how blood sugar gets managed within the bloodstream and into the cells and used. But also insulin is a very important obesity hormone because if your insulin levels are high, which happens when there's insulin resistance, 
then you tend to pack on more fat in the middle and it just becomes this, you know, it's a cascade and then it becomes this basically unending cycle. So that is the, that is a very important piece of the puzzle that a lot of people don't talk about is the gut obesity connection that ties in through leaky gut, through endotoxemia from endotoxin, gram negative bacteria in the gut. And we all have these bacteria. So it's a matter of how good is that interface at keeping that stuff out, not letting it get through, because then it's going to come into your body and it's going to scramble your hormones. It's going to increase inflammation signals. It does a whole bunch of other things. So in the brain, it increases inflammation in the hypothalamus, which then causes mood disorder. So depression. And when you have something like depression, then think what do depressed people do? They eat more comfort foods, you know, so then it becomes the, the gut the brain connection as well. And I think all of these factors then tie into why it is that healing the gut is the key missing element in a lot of programs out there that manage weight gain and obesity because it really comes down to if you want sustained weight loss, you really need to look at the gut microbiome, the gut lining, and work on reversing leaky guts. You can lower endotoxemia, lower insulin resistance, and all of that, as we're learning, is coming from the gut microbiome and that interaction that happens through that interface, the gut lining. I love that we're talking about this because you tend to hear around this time of year, all right, you know, you got to exercise more, you got to eat less, you got to do this, you got to do that. But the reality is there are external or actually internal factors that are contributing to our ability to shed unwanted weight. And so with that said, in terms of, you know, endotoxemia, how do we avoid endotoxins? And, or, and, and shield against endotoxins? And then how do we know if we have endotoxemia? Yeah, these are great questions. There are certain labs that can actually check for anti-lipopolysaccharide antibodies, so anti-endotoxin. -endo these are specialty labs that do this. If I can mention some, like Cyrex or Vibrant America Labs, uh, they can run these tests. You can also check for anti-zonulin antibodies and anti-vinculin. So you can check for antibodies to cytoskeletal proteins that are the structural proteins that hold together the, the cells that line the gut. And the idea is that when you see these antibodies, that there is too much of this getting through. So the body is actually creating an immune reaction. In studies, you can actually measure endotoxin directly. I found it much harder to, to do with commercial labs because you really have to time it. Because endotoxin is going to go up and it's going to uh, go down. So you have to catch it really fast after a meal. Depending on the type of meals that people eat, if it's a really fatty meal with unhealthy fats, that's going to push more endotoxin through. So if you're, you know, and I don't want to vilify fat because I don't want someone to listen to this and then say, well, oh, I don't want endotoxemia. I'm going to eat less fat. But we know that fat doesn't make us fat. What makes us fat are excessive carbohydrate, refined carbs, excess sugar. And again, the gut obesity connection, which has to do with the gut lining, but can also have to do with eating foods that one is sensitive to, meaning that you have an immune reaction to these foods. And whenever you're sensitive to a food, What's going to happen is that food, when it comes into your system, it's going to gen generate an immune reaction. It's also going to draw in more water. So it's going to cause water retention. And everybody knows when you, if you carry a, a gallon of water, it's really heavy. So just a little bit extra water in the body is going to make your, you feel more weighty. It can make the joints feel tighter. It can make you feel kind of, kind of achy, kind of stiff. Look, we, we've talked all sorts of different diet protocols here, whether it's anti-inflammatory diet or, you know, our friend, Dr. Gundry has his lectin-free diet, which is, you know, we won't go there. Is there such a thing as an 
endotoxin free diet. If, if this is something that you're listening, you're like, you know what, whatever I'm doing, it's not working. You've got to think about this. There, there are certain fats that are not going to cause as much endotoxemia as others. For example, like olive oil. And everybody knows the Mediterranean diet, one of the healthiest diets in the world, by the way, which also has lectins in it. So I wrote a whole series in my blog, um, happygutlife.com that I called the lectin paradox is a little, <laughs> and basically what I found is it's not as clear cut and dry as Dr. Grundry might say. And I called it a paradox because the lectins actually might be a red herring. And through my research, what I found is that it's really more a gut lining issue and a gut microbiome issue that's causing us to look at the red herring, which is the lectins. And yeah, there could be more issues with lectins, yeah. but I think there's a whole missed part. And I know Dr. Gundry is now getting into the gut health and yes. gut microbiome stuff. So I think he's catching on to that. 100% agreed. You're talking to a guy who eats beans probably twice a week. Look, people in the blue zones eat lectin rich foods and they live to a hundred plus. So I think we've got to think about, you know, rethink this lectin thing. There's more to it, you know, cause it worries me that we might tell people to not eat foods that we know have incredible benefits for the gut microbiome, as well as our health. hundred percent agreed. You know, just anecdotally, I will move on from our, for our old friend, Dr. Gundry. The one thing I have heard is people who've had, you know, autoimmune issues and haven't been able to make progress, they incorporate the lectin free diet and it works for them. So I think, I think in certain circumstances yeah. it works, but I think for most people, it's like, I, I love my beans. And you have to, in, the, in those cases with autoimmune disease, there have been some question marks about how lectins might get absorbed and tagged to cells and kind of flag them for the immune system. So then lectins might be the avenue by which autoimmune disease can start. But as we know from the work of Dr. Alessio Fasano at Harvard, there are three factors that lead to autoimmunity. One is an environmental trigger, right? The other one is genetic predisposition. And so the environmental trigger, by the way, um, for Dr. Fasano was wheat gluten, for example, exposure to wheat gluten, which uh, in some ways looks like the surface of, of a bacteria, it's epitopes. So we've got that. It could be antibiotics. Also exposure to antibiotics and as an environmental factor. So then we've got genetic predisposition, but then you need one third factor and that's leaky gut. So if you have those three, then your chances of developing autoimmunity increase by a lot. It's a simplification, but I think it's also a really interesting model to really, to understand that just because you might have autoimmunity in your family. It doesn't mean that you're going to develop an autoimmune disease. You're not sentenced to it. And that was part of actually what motivated me to do the work that I got into in functional medicine and all, because my older sister has an autoimmune disease, multiple sclerosis. And my mom had a uh, seronegative uh, rheumatoid arthritis, so rheumatoid arthritis yeah. without any blood markers, but it was obvious towards the end of her life that she had actually developed rheumatoid arthritis. And I looked at that and I thought, okay, what can I do? You know, I'm in my early to mid thirties. I don't want to develop these diseases. What can I change right now about my lifestyle? Just think about that. You know, like how many people sit down and think proactively and think 10 years down the road, I don't want to be that. So what do I need to do today to be able to improve my health? Well, we know one thing for sure. If you lose weight and maintain that weight loss, that's going to alter your risk for all sorts of chronic diseases, you know? So it's such a great time. I, I mean, I always think like how interesting that we have these demarcations that are really just, we've just created these markers, you know, like it's the January 1st is a new year and that's when everybody's thinking about like weight loss and cleansing, but the, it's just the way it is. And I think as humans, we need 
things that motivate us. And there's a beauty to the arrival of a baby. And I think there's also the beauty to the arrival of a new year that allows you to reevaluate how it is that you lived the previous year and what is it that you want to change or even just improve upon in the coming year. Building off of that, in terms of food, in terms of diet, you know, I think it's safe to say that all our listeners are a healthy bunch. They're a smart bunch. They're, they're probably doing a lot of things right, if not all things right. I love our listeners. With that said, are there some unsuspecting foods that, you know, we might be enjoying and consuming in large quantities because we all think they're healthy. We think they're good for our gut but and weight management, but in reality, you know, maybe not so good. Yeah. And the answer to that question can, uh, actually be dependent on underlying conditions, you know, so a healthy diet is healthy until things go awry with the gut. And then that healthy diet is no longer healthy as I've seen over many years taking care of, you know, like women who came in eating an, an all raw diet, all cold foods. They feel sick to their stomach all the time. They're not digesting their food properly. So even a salad could not be so good for a person who doesn't have adequate stomach acid, who's not producing enough digestive enzymes. They will have difficulty breaking down protein. But even foods like fermented foods are not right for everyone. Someone who has candida overgrowth, it might be too much of a shock to the system to introduce too many fermented foods at once because they can cause die off. And I've seen that with patients where they can only tolerate like a quarter of a teaspoon of kraut juice to start off with once or every other day. And you think about it, it's really small amount, but you know, bacteria are concentrated. Even one quarter teaspoon can have hundreds of thousands of bacteria. So even fermented foods for people who have underlying gut issues like candida, uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth might make them feel bloated, heavy, uncomfortable, cause abdominal pain. Same thing for people with mast cell activation. People who have histamine issues because of gut issues, they can have trouble with foods like a chicken bone broth, which is also very high in histamine. And you would think is healthy, but in someone with mast cell uh, activation or with uh, histamine issues is going to have trouble with that. I know there's a lot of obvious ones like gluten and dairy, things like that. What a lot of people might not realize is that if you react to gluten, there's a very high likelihood that you might cross react with corn. And. I think your listeners are very educated, but you know, for those who might not remember, corn and wheat are cousins, you know, they're like family members. So if you react to one, it could be possible you don't react as strongly to the other one. As I recently learned, because I decided, you know, to do the wheat zoomer and the corn zoomer by Vibrant America Labs to just check. I already know that I'm gluten sensitive and I don't have gluten, but it was interesting to see even after years of being primarily gluten free that I still had antibodies to wheat proteins. And I was curious because I had an inkling. I love Mexican food. And you know, when you go for Mexican, you can't eat gluten. At least you think, well, I can have a corn tortilla. Like it's like Christmas for me when I can have a corn tortilla. And the corn zoomer, I came up positive for at least one of the corn proteins. So, and I already suspected it, that I knew I could tolerate some corn, but there is a threshold. And, and that's a thing with some of these foods that you might be reactive to a food. Maybe the reaction is not so strong. And you already intuitively might think, you know, if you're asking the question, and I think this is important for people to think about being very, you know, being more intuitive about listening to their body reactions. If you're asking the question and you're having some doubt in your head, you probably are having some level of reaction to the food. And the question is, you know, maybe you can tolerate a, a threshold amount. Like maybe you can just have a couple and you're okay. But if you go beyond that threshold, you're not okay. And then that's going to activate your immune system and that's going to cause weight gain. It's going to cause water retention, et cetera. 
you know, I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, f for me, I'm not necessarily sensitive to, to gluten and corn, but my view on those is similar to, you know, sugar. Although I, I would say when I'm going to do it, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to make it count. I'm going to make sure it's the best damn piece of bread. It's a great sourdough, you know, for corn, I don't have a lot of it. I'll, I'll give a shout out to my friends who have a, a restaurant called Los Felix in, in Coconut Grove. They do heirloom corn. It's amazing. So it's like, if I'm going to do the, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to make it count. It's going to be the best yeah. damn thing. If I'm going to have sugar, it's going to be an amazing donut from donut plant here in New York. Like I just, that, that's sort of my attitude. If you're going to do it. You shouldn't have those things every day, but if you're going to do it, make it count and enjoy it. I think that's a really important message as we, you know, we enter diet and cleansing season because people can go into deprivation mode. And I think if you give yourself permission to like, if you're going to really do it with class <laughs> and really enjoy it, so you demarcate those moments. And I think the more you can do that, the more you can actually say no to the non-elegant moments when it's not going to be so great, because then you're choosing your health over, you know, that brief, you know, transient pleasure that one gets the dopamine hit from having sugar or whatever it is, comfort food. And so, you know, you brought up foods that might not be working and, and look, I've mentioned this before on the show, but I'll mention it again, you know, in that bucket of foods that may not work for you, I, I think our listeners get this, but you know, again, I'm going to repeat it and you had a great tweet on this, the fake meat, the fake burgers. I, I think they're fun. I think they're good options for people who have s severe cardiovascular issues and, and can't eat red meat and it's okay to have them once in a while but they're not healthy. And you mm -hmm. had a great tweet about what's your take on fake meat and the gut? Not so good. No, I think there's many layers to that. One, a lot of these fake meats are stuffed with additives, corn derivatives like maltodextrin, things that are just not so healthy for us. You know, they may be gluten-free. That doesn't mean that they're healthy <laughs> for us. And I, I certainly don't think that they're good for the environment either, which I think is really, I know it's a much bigger conversation, but I do believe that, that as much as we, we care for our health, we have to be stewards of the environment and thinking about what's coming in because what we harbor inside of us is a reflection of that external environment, you know, that. The gut microbiome and the soil microbiome are interconnected. And when you might be including ingredients in these, you know, Franken foods that are possibly genetically modified versions of corn that are being raised on fields that are just being doused with glyphosate, which is not good for the environment and actually increases nitrogen in the soil and and carbon dioxide and actually methane gas, which is even worse. You know, I think from the bigger picture if someone, if you're choosing to eat vegetarian for many reasons, for animal rights and also for the environment, eating these vegetarian meat substitutes is actually not helping the environment, you know, and it's not helping your gut. Yep. either. I think the most important message and what I've found with working with people over the years who have done the Happy Gut Reboot 20 Day Cleanse is that we, the closer we eat to the way that nature made of food, the healthier we are, the healthier we become. Amen. Amen. And that is across the board. So when you're <laughs> starting to make things that have got like multiple ingredients and yeah, I mean, it might taste good. It might have the texture of meat, whatever it is, but it's just not going to be as healthy for us. Amen. So intermittent fasting is something that works for so many people in terms of, you know, blood sugar, in terms of managing weight, just it works for a lot of people and it helps them feel great. It works for me, but there's also a lot of people where it just doesn't work for them. And that's the beauty of what we do. There's no one size fits all approach. 
But if you had to, if you had to give some suggestions to those people listening where intermittent fasting just really doesn't work and they kind of need to eat breakfast to feel good, what breakfast do you recommend for someone who wants to focus on, you know, healthy weight support? That's a great question. So this is one thing that I've found. So we talked about endotoxin and its relation to weight gain. The other thing that I've found through the work that I've done with patients is that the one thing that's going to get in the way of weight loss or cause weight loss resistance or that dreaded weight loss plateau that a lot of people hit is sluggish detoxification. So if your body cannot detox properly, then you're just not going to shed the pounds. So being able to support phase one and phase two liver detoxification, which is one pillar of detoxification, the liver, but there are three pillars I think that are important. There's more, but I like to call it, think of the three pillars because they're all in the gut arena, the liver, the gut, and the gut microbiome. So supporting those three um, pillars of detoxification with a functional food. And that's part of what I created with happy gut is the cleanse shake, which is basically a gentle detoxer that supports liver detoxification, uh, gut detoxification is a great for, for me, making a smoothie when I'm in a rush is a great breakfast substitute because I can pack a lot of nutrition into that smoothie. So not just using a functional food powder, protein powder, but also throwing in blueberries. I'll throw in some greens. I'll put in some hemp seeds. You know, another day I'll put in some pecans or macadamia nuts. So every day you can mix it up. And for someone who can't miss breakfast, will then make breakfast a superfood for you. And I think one of the best ways to do that is by just substituting breakfast with a smoothie. And even if you can't do intermittent fasting, like you can't do those 14, 16 hours, 20 hours, like Dr. Fung uh, does for, for people with insulin resistance. And like you said, it's personalized. Not everybody, it's not good for everyone. And there's actually differences between men and women. Women shouldn't be doing long fasts. It's just not good for their hormones. But everyone pretty much can do a 12-hour fast. And if you can have a well-rounded dinner plate with, protein, fat, complex carbohydrates, vegetables, salad that fills you up. You finish eating dinner by 730 and then don't eat anything after dinner until the next day. That overnight fast is really important for balancing blood sugar. So to, to build off of, you know, what, what you mentioned about your smoothie, what, what's a day in the life for you? You know, if you could walk us through, like, what do you have? If you are having breakfast, you know, what's in your yeah. breakfast, what's in your lunch and what's in your dinner? If you could briefly walk us through, that would be great. Yeah. My, my typical day is either working from home or getting up and two days a week, I, I rush out and, and go to the office in Midtown. And depending on how much time I have the day, I have two kind of main alternating breakfasts, and then sometimes I'll circle in some other things. But one is a smoothie, and it might be with my Happy Gut Cleanse Shake powder if I want more of a cleansing effect, or it might be with my, it might, it, I rotate different hypoallergenic proteins. So I might use the Nature MD brand Nutri Protein, which is a brand that I work with. And so full disclosure there, but it actually tastes really good. It's a chocolate vanilla flavor. And I also use the Nourish Protein that is part of the Happy Gut Essentials program. But I always mix in other things. So I'm always kind of bringing in some other super nutrients to put in there. I like putting in Moringa powder. I like putting in greens, blueberries, other nuts. And that's one breakfast that I might have um, uh, if i am got to head out the door quickly. And the, alter the alternative, which I, I love and I'm lucky that I'm not sensitive to egg whites or egg yolks, is I'll have pasture-raised eggs, either from the farmer's market or from the health food store that I pick up that are rich in omega-3s. And I'll put those on a gluten-free toast from Meredith's Bread here in New York, based out of Kingston, makes 
the best gluten-free, one of the best gluten-free breads. The other brand that I really like is called Sim Simple Needs. And we can find them here in Whole Foods. I don't think they're all over the country. But both of those brands, like Simple Needs makes Pumpernickel, which it was, I don't know about you, but that was my all-time favorite growing up. And I was so, if, if there was one bread that I was sad that I couldn't eat because of being gluten-free, it was Pumpernickel. So when I discovered that they make a fermented pumpernickel, I was just overboard, so happy. So it would be a toasted gluten-free bread, maybe with some coconut oil, with an, a sunny side up egg with the egg yolk runny. And I'll also put avocado on that. And that's my alternate breakfast when I need something a little more substantial. And not every day do you want to drink a smoothie. Lunch is going to be pretty low carb, high vegetable maybe some protein with it. And dinner is usually me cooking at home and it's got a variety of things. I tend to, I tend to make a good amount of carbs because I have a 17 year old boy who plays volleyball and he's six foot five and he's trying to gain weight and put on muscle. So <laughs> he's got a very high metabolism. So there's always some carb put in there, but there's always a salad. There's always some sort of steamed vegetable and some humanely raised, grass-fed, hormone-free, pasture, pastured protein that might be in there. So it sounds like you're pretty close to like 70 to 80% plant-based. Yeah, I would part. say so. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to argue with that. Like no matter where you want, I, I've said this again so many times in the show, but it's kind of hard to argue with 70 to 80% plant-based. Yeah, I think within there, there's a lot of different, you know, places where people lie in terms of their belief systems. And, and also for me, like it's my individual approach, what I found works for my body. And I personally can't go full vegan. I, I start not feeling well. Sure. I'm with you. Um... And having just the right choice of proteins, uh, just is the right amount that may, that just keeps my energy going. And I think that's really important for people, you know, one, like you said, you can't go wrong if you go more plant-based. What, whatever that percent is, as, as soon as it crosses 50%, you're just doing better for your body. Yep. Then reduce your sugar intake, reduce your intake of refined carbohydrates, and that's the one thing, you know, I was talking about weight loss resistance, hitting a weight loss plateau. And so I had what I called the happy gut mini cleanse. And last year during the pandemic, I had so much time to just think about things that I decided I wanted to redesign that program, make it something simpler, something quicker for people. So I went from 14 days to seven days. And I focused it on liver detoxification and basically detox support. And what really surprised me about it was when I started getting, you know, messages from people that I couldn't lose those last 10 pounds for the last two years. And I did the seven day detox and suddenly I just dropped the weight. And what that tells me is that, okay, we've got to think about the gut. We've got to think about endotoxin, about leaky gut, but you've also have to think about how you're detoxing, because if you're not detoxing properly, your body cannot shed that weight. So is there, I, look, again, I know it's hard to generalize and it's an oversimplification, but I'll, I'll just go for it anyway. Is there one thing that you think a food or a lifestyle change, or is there one thing that you think could move the needle slightly, if only by 5% or 10% that everyone can do, which would probably help them a little bit with managing weight? Yeah, I hear you. For everyone, it can be a, a little bit different and it's different between a male and a female. As anyone knows, men can make a small change and they lose weight. Women make the same small change depending on whether they're pre postmenopausal, nothing moves. So depending on the person, it could be as simple as, you know, when everybody was eating out and I know people are eating out more now is passing on the bread at the dinner table. Like don't let them put the bread down, you know, start cutting out, you know, just kind of like cutting off the fluff on the edges that, you know, if you have one, 
you're just going to continue having more. But I even want to go, I even want to kind of go meta and go even above that. The other thing that people really need to think about is you're not going to lose weight until your mind is ready to lose that weight. Because this is where the habits are. This is where the reason for the habits are coming, the emotional eating, the stress. So really working on getting yourself more into the parasympathetic rest and digest state. It's a more intuitive state. It's actually a state where people tend to not overeat because you're more connected with your body. You're more connected with the signals that are coming from your gut to tell you that you're full. When you're eating in the sympathetic state, you're eating emotionally, you don't know when to stop. You just keep going. You're not thinking. You're not connecting. You're, there's a disconnect with your body. So I think mindset is really important before embarking on any type of program because it really should not be about dieting. It should be about choosing the lifestyle that is best for you. And that's why initially I created my 28 day program because it takes at least three weeks to change habits. And what I found when I led people through the program, and by the way, I'm going to be leading people on the cleanse this January again. When I led people on the program, at the end of it, they felt so much better that they would have to be insane to go back and start eating the way they used to. But they're able to, they're able to make better choices. Once you're shown the potential for the transformation, you can really then and embed those lifestyle changes. But if you're not ready here, if you don't think you deserve it, if you don't think that you're worthy enough, if you've got self-hatred inside, if you've got a lot of negative thought patterns, you need to work on that first. You've got to change the mind to then change the body. I love it. It all comes down to mindset. Vincent, well said. Thank you so much.